Welcome back to Wake Up with Nubian Tigers Talk, a podcast brought to you by a group of Black Princeton alumni, where we talk about issues that impact our Black communities. So Michelle, because of the pandemic, I have not set foot in the Black theater, Black uh, showcase, Black anything, um, and it's, it's driving me crazy. So now, uh, even though people still haven't complied with all the pandemic right, rules, right. Uh, the theater is going to open back up. It's open back up, um, although with some uh, restrictions to help prevent the spread of this Delta variant of the mm -hmm, COVID. Mm -hmm. So on today's show, we brought together two Black playwrights who are going to talk to us about um, the experience of their experiences in the theater as a playwright and, and as actor as well, and what they uh, think we'll be looking forward to when the season opens. And uh, Michelle, so one of our guests um, kind of like is a triple threat when it comes to entertainment and whatever. Actress, uh, sh her name is Sharon Washington. She starred on the stage, she starred on the screen, television in her 30 year career. On the big screen, she's appeared in such films as Die Hard with a Vengeance, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Spike Lee's Malcolm X, and most recently opposite Joaquin Phoenix in The Joker. And some of her television credits include Blue Bloods, Madam Secretary, The Blacklist, along with a recurring role in Law and Order and Law and Order SUV as Judge Virginia Hayes. And I don't know if people watch SUV or Law and Order at all, but believe it or not, my brother Mark was also a judge. So either Black people are either judges or they're the perpetrators <laughs> on Law and Order. Uh, on the stage, she co-starred in the Tony-nominated musical, The Scottsboro Boys, which was fabulous, and off-Broadway productions such as Richard III with Denzel Washington, Wild with Happy, While I Yet Live, Dot. And she now has expanded her career to include playwriting, where she wrote and starred in her own one-woman performance entitled Feeding the Dragon, where she was nominated for a Lucille Lortel Award an Outer Critics Circle Award, and won an Ordelco Award. Sharon's a graduate of Dartmouth, and on a personal note, she and I attended the Dalton School together in New York City, and we've known each other for over 40 years, and I am one of the charter members of her fan club. Roger Q. Mason self-describes as a Black, Philippinex, plus-size, gender non-conforming queer artist of color. Roger is an OA graduate of Princeton University and went on to receive an MA from Middlebury College and an MFA at Northwestern University. Roger's work has been on Broadway, Off-Broadway, Off-Off-Broadway, in LA, Chicago, and in many regional theaters. I found two quotes from Roger that I think set the tone of their work around increasing the visibility of the LGBT community's experience through their play. Quote, sometimes all somebody needs is to feel like they exist, end quote. The other um, saying I heard Roger, from Roger is that he describes the theater as a, quote, holy seeing place where we can envision worlds different and more inclusive than our own. This is reflected in his work on The Lavender Men, The White Dress, and in From Kaya, a series of narratives from a transgendered woman who was incarcerated. Roger is the recipient of the Chuck Rowland Pioneer Award and was mentioned in the Fire This Time Festival Alumni Spotlight. And he was a semifinalist for the Shonda Rhimes Emerging Playwright Award. Welcome to the show, Roger. So let's, let's start um, at, uh, at 2020 um, with the pandemic and uh, in particular, the uh, murder of George Floyd by the police. And you guys are in the entertainment industry. We haven't talked to anyone from the entertainment industry as of yet, but we'd like to get each of your perspectives on how you think your industry was affected. Sharon, why don't you go first? So um, I think our industry was affected in uh, very ground shaking, shifting, landscape shifting, paradigm shifting ways. Mm. Um, I think that, um, you know, as artists, as actors, performers, it takes a lot of study and time and dedication. And, um, and I can speak, I will speak from the eye because that's something I've learned um, as I do a lot of this work is to speak from the eye. What I know to be true is that 
when you're on a course to do something as difficult as make it in show business, you become very, um, you have to put your blinders on. You become hyper-focused and you become very much about looking inward, right? And you're on this track and you've got to do this and you're looking for the next job and you're looking. So a lot of times, <laughs> you know, actors, particularly you're accused of being selfish and you know where it's all about us and it's just because the it's so intense to do what we do that uh, a lot of times we are just preoccupied with what we need to do to ourselves and and how we need to prepare ourselves for the next gig i say all that to say what happened was we began looking outward and a lot of what it usually doesn't affect us, but that is sort of on the peripheries or that what, you know, we write about if you're a writer or if you're a performer, you take in, you know, you reflect the times as, you know, Miss Simone would say, you reflect the times, but, but it's kind of out in the periphery. Well, it was, it was so visceral and so guttural and what we were all experiencing. Um, and, and, as with everyone with the murder of George Floyd, it was just, it, it, it time's up, it was enough. And so it, it really moved us forward. And, and I think in a lot of different ways, I mean, the organizations that came out of that, I think there was a lot of internal work, there was individual work that happened and, and people started, we started calling them testimonies. People started speaking out about what was going on specifically. Like it was not just this, I heard that this people, it was very specific and names were being named, which was very unusual in this business because you don't want to name a name that might actually be in the position of hiring you. Mm -hmm. All bets were off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once that started happening, it was just the floodgates opened and out of that came a lot of the movements that happened. Uh, we see you what, Black Theater United, um, came out of this outrage and this need for justice and what can we do in our community? I think everybody was looking to their own community about this can't continue, this can't go on. And that's what, that's what happened, I think, in our community. Roger, how did you see it from your perspective? Yeah, yeah and if I can uh, just add with Roger, uh, your work is already um, about those marginalized communities, right? So you, you're already out there. And uh, so it's really, I'd be really curious to see how the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killings um, impacted your work since you're already out there on the sort of on Well, the yeah, I, first of all, thank you both for having us on. I mean, the, the, to, to be given space to talk to a community of our peers um, in, in the US and abroad um, we share the the Nubian identity is really a, a powerful thing, you know, to know that we are connected in spirit and in ancestry in this way. So I just want to say that the first thing that happened was I think we as Black folks had to do the work, the unifying work of coming together. Because of course, the way that slavery in this country functioned is that it it disseminated folks and dis and separated us from home. So we have always been strangers in a strange land because that is the familial and, 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 and psychosocial trauma that we are trying to counterbalance and yet consistently falling victim to in our community because that's how we were placed here. You took mama and sent her to the Johnson plantation and daddy went over here to the to the McDowell's and this one went to this one and that one and that's because you divide and conquer if there's no sense of home. Then they can't rise up so the so we are looking at a 400 year experiment that worked, unfortunately, because we have always struggled with how to find home not only in this land, but also amongst ourselves and each other, so I think one of the things that this did was for the the black queer and trans community, it put us at the forefront of the dialogue because this is our black history and our black lineage as well. You know, just thinking about um, figures like Bayard Rustin, whose sexual life was in many ways um, muted uh, 
for most of his natural born life. It's really just in recent years that we're seeing that quiet as it's kept, not only was he fighting the civil rights fight, he was also fighting the sexual and gender rights fight and how many other countless folks. Now, now Marsha P. Johnson is a part of Black History Month. You know, we weren't talking about our queer and trans Black um, folks in the ways that we are now, because in order for one of us to be free, we all have to be free. So I think there was a lot of shifting that had to happen. I, I will also speak from the first person on this. You know, my dad uh, was born in Oklahoma City and his family is from Del Valley, Texas, outside of Austin. He grew up in LA. And like many masculine affirming cisgender male black men, you know, I was queer shamed at growing up. And just watching his own personal evolution over the last really two years, learning to embrace a child who is gender nonconforming and pansexual has really been a joy for me to witness. Our fathers, our mothers are growing because of this pandemic and because, well, this pandemic, which is racism, not <laughs> slash COVID, you know? So we're, we, we are having a bit of a Sankofa moment because we're looking back and we're pulling our parents and our grandparents with us as we're fighting on the front lines towards uh, liberation. I think the other thing that happened is that white decision makers had to actually change now how long that change is going to last is a question up for debate because most if not all of the new plays on broadway this coming season are by black playwrights but what's going to happen next season and the season after that because we always know that 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 in in the face of accountability you know, white power will always, you know, shot, shoot off a few symbolic flare guns to, to, to dispel, you know, any concerns. But then is it going to go back to business as usual? Who knows? And who will tell that is us because we have to be in positions of power and decision making in those rooms, constantly reminding people that equity and inclusion is not a destination, but a journey. Putting one play up doesn't solve 400 years of systemic racism. Mm -hmm. Having one season of diversity and inclusion on stage does not undo the, the work of feeling ineligible or invisible before the majority population. So we have to work on this constantly. And all of us do, because we cannot be the singular ambassadors of freedom. We also need other people to do the work as well. And you know, they always say, well, what what you you would know best what to do for your community. <laughs> you know, you need to know, uh, you know. Go ahead, Roger. I, I oh, that's a, that was it. That was it. <laughs> well, I, you know, that actually leads me to one of the articles I think Sharon sent me, which was um, in the Times from last year. And a gentleman by the name of William Carden, who is the artistic director for the Ensemble Studio Theater in New mm. York, he plans to leave his post. Uh, if he has, if he hasn't done it already, and his quote uh, was, uh, "The key to anti-racism is sharing power. It takes a lot of work and a lot of humility, and it requires that white people step aside." So, how do you guys each feel about that? Do you think that uh, he is he's he's actually put his finger on the issue, or is that just is that just all for the press? Well, I, I think, you know, Roger said it it, it, it can't just be us. And that's, you know, it, it there, you know, there's the talk of allyship and, um, you know, what can we do? What can, you know, because I, I think what another shift that has happened, and again, I can speak from the eye, is that I'm really not going to any more diversity, equity, and inclusion seminars, meetings, what, that's not, that's not on me. That's on you. So I think the shift that has also happened is like, y'all need to do the work. Mm -hmm. The work is, we're not, that's not on us. So I think that's part. So when I see that, I'm like, yes, amen. Step forward, speak up, do what you think, step aside. If that's what you feel like you need to do, I, we're not telling anybody anymore 
We're not here to inform you to, you do the work. Um, and so I think that was a shift as well. Um, I think also coming out of the, um, when the, the murders happened, there were all these statements from theaters about, you know, solidarity, statements mm -hmm. of solidarity. They mm -hmm. were flying like, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. I read one more and I, and, and then- well, so what performative happened, work, right? So, oh, my, so the <laughs> eye rolling that was happening within the community was like, <laughs> I, now I have 12 stories about that theater that just sent out that statement of solidarity. Mm. Mm. Right, Sharon. Come on. Sharon, come on. Sharon. We, we can't, mm -mm. we may break so, the internet. We may break the internet today. We, you'd read it and just be like, oh, and you could hear the pages flying with black artists all over the country. Just like, oh no, not from this theater. <laughs> well, the pro, I mean, I, I, without, you know, saying things and, and naming names, you know, I, I read some of these and I, and I, and, and I know, you know, and, and the story, again, like what you're saying, Sharon, the stories, but not, not just like stories from the past, but pretty recent stories. Like you sent out this, this email in March and last fall you were saying stuff to me. Exactly. You, exactly. You are, you're not a different person today than you were in the fall. And, and, and if, if these are theaters that perpetuate largely, you know, white, either retired or upwardly mobile, quote, woke audiences that buy subscriptions, because let's just be real, who are they performing this for? And at a certain point, it actually becomes a performance for them to feel good about their stance on racism so that they can continue cultural exploitation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've, I've said it, I apologize. Now let me just go continue mm -hmm. perpetuating who I was before. Mm -hmm. Because you ain't apologizing to me. Because mm -hmm. if you were apologizing to me, you would have produced that play already. That's you, a really, I wouldn't, really I, good if you, point. Mm -hmm. you, if, if you had apologized to me, I wouldn't have had to advocate for, you know, one, you know, one fee rate or over another. And I listen, and I've worked with some really wonderful companies too. And I'm going to, I am going to name this name. Um, Courage Theater in Los Angeles is an example of a theater that walks the walk and talks the talk. They, they, not, they have been about diversity and inclusion and equity way before anybody was looking. And the way that they handle new play development, they engage in very transparent, very humane, and very deliberate, equitable conversation with artists. Because what, what we have, to, what, what needs to be said about playwriting is that unless it's an off-Broadway or Broadway contract or regional contract, it's the wild, wild west in terms of how we, we are um, compensated for our work. Mm. And because there are no standard standardized fees for commissions in those realms. So you really get to see the voice and the face and, mm -hmm. and, and the attitude of a company based on who they are when nobody's looking. My grandmother used to say, you are who you are when nobody's looking. And so companies that will, will be very honest and forthright and, and do everything they can to do the right thing when there's no surveillance or accountability systems around them. Those are the places where you really want to work. And there are plenty of theaters like this, but one that's coming to mind today, because you know I just had a great development conversation with the AD yesterday about a piece we're working on, is Courage Theater, because this is a company that realizes, look, we are a community-based organization, but we want to make sure that everybody feels acknowledged and honored for their work. And not just when it's fashionable or tokenist, uh, 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 tokenistically, uh, well, tokenistically advantageous. Oh, oh, tokenistically advantageous. Well, I think I'd have to write yes. this down. You know what I'm saying? Not, yes. not, not just when the cameras are on, but all the time. And that's the key: is mm -hmm. to get people to change their true and genuine relationship and behavior to inclusion, not just be an Easter and Christmas Christian, but make a joyful noise unto the Lord 
all the time. The Lord. Well, and I think that's exactly right. And that was, you're talking about the difference of what happened uh, in 2020 is that because of the thing, all the triggers started rolling. And so when we started seeing these statements of solidarity, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. like, oh no, not, not on today. No. Mm -mm. Not, not again. This is not, not today because I know what you said to me last week. Exactly. So that's when, when we're moving past, so we're moving past these statements that were written by your, you know, press department to what are you actually going to do? Here is, what is the accountability? Okay, you say that, but we have, and we kept saying, but we got the receipts. See, so you're right. going to say that, but we're going to have this brother over here who's going to publish your name and the person who said it. So now what do you have to say? Well, see, racism happens in the dark. Mm. So that... Boom. Racism, so racism always happens in the dark. And, and, and we all know this. It happens in those deep, dark crevices of American social shame. The alley ways of our very national identity. That is where racism occurs and where it's perpetrated and where it's learned and where it's passed on and passed down and perfected. So yeah. we need to just cast a blazing light mm -hmm. onto those alleys and say, we see you, we see you, we hear you, we won't let you get away with it. And we have a system of accountability in place that will make sure that you will not be able to perpetuate this without consequence again. Now that last component is the most important because we perform too. Mm -hmm. You can call out, and, honey, let me tell you what he said last night. Okay, that don't mean shit. That's just called, my father's an attorney. That's called hearsay. What's actionable in court, honey? Mm -hmm. And what systems can we put in place to maintain and manage behavior? A. Leon Higginbotham says in 1992, you can't change people's minds, but the law can do much to regulate behavior. Mm -hmm. mm. Just that's like, cited one of my favorite jurors. We're not... <laughs> we're not we can't change their minds because their minds are made up. Their minds were ingrained 400 years ago yeah. when a slave rebellion took the white indentured servants and gave them four more years of work and lynched the blacks. Yeah, so that, mm -hmm. that, that takes me to a good question though. So you've mentioned that the next season, the new season coming up, it's gonna be uh, eight black plays, I think. Yes. Uh, we see white plays that open and close all the time, right? right. Uh, we see white uh, film directors who put bombs out and yet, you know, the next year they'll have another uh, multi-million dollar project on the line. And so when I saw that eight plays were coming out, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, if even one of them is not good, what's gonna happen after that? And it, it when I was listening to you guys uh, just doing different uh, talking online, different uh, recordings online, I noticed that you both focused on the importance of being in a theater group that is supportive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sharon, you talked about City Theater. Roger, you talked about the Echo Theater. You also just mentioned Courage. How, how important is those theater connections to the ability of a playwright, let's say, to maybe survive a play that doesn't do well, or if it does do well, to get the backing to continue to be uh, progressive in terms of the material that you're putting out. That wasn't one of our prepared questions, but in listening to you, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that I'm, I, I worry about, right? Every time Alva DuVernay puts out a film, everybody's on pins and needles. Is it gonna make you know fifty million dollars, or will people turn around and say, "Oh, you see, we gave the black woman some money and it didn't work out"? So, on the theater side, how how does all that play out? Well, I think it plays out in different ways. Yes, is the short answer to yes. It's always wonderful to have a theater home where you can try and fail and put something up that's half baked, and you still get that support, and you get you know you get good feedback, you get feedback with positivity and love and encouragement like you need that home you because you can't you can't grow as an artist you have to be able to fail you have to go to the scary places you have to put it out there and be able to fall on your face and go Oop, well that wasn't right let me go see if I can try that again so 
But what I will add to that is say that Broadway is a whole different can of worms, ball of wax, kettle of fish. That's just, you don't have that opportunity. That's not that. It's a completely separate situation. So things have been nurtured to get to Broadway, but Broadway is a beast unto itself. And that's why I'm highly nervous about this season. Highly nervous yeah. and suspect. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I, I will that. say this, I will say this about writers groups. Um, so my current uh, artistic home, and I and I'm proud to say this, is page 73, which is an a, you know, an incubator for for new work in New York. And I'm in their program Interstate 73, and I feel extremely extraordinarily supported and taken care of. You know, Sharon, you're talking about failing, failing graciously and 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 brilliantly. I was working on a play and for some strange odd reason, I had sent the wrong version of the script to the group. And I did not know this because I had written what we were asked to, which was 45, a 45 minute excerpt. And there was only five pages that they were sent and I didn't know because child it was 1 a.m and you know I just then I went about my day and it was four o'clock and it's time to be in the zoom and we pressed it okay I'm here hello you know and we just you know coronavirus in around and running through with mask on and all of this I just went to the stove and I get there and they give the most beautiful amplifying um statement and they start talking about the same scene all of them and I realized well, did y'all read because they start asking questions about the next scene and the, and we don't know what's happening next i'm like no but you do because it's the next page and i realized oh they didn't read the rest and they said well you know that was the most brilliant excerpt you know five pages the most talked about five pages in page 73 history and i said five pages five pages of what <laughs> you only send us five pages and I look in the email and it was the wrong file. I named them, one was an ex, like a tester and then the other one was the actual pages. And these people were gracious and supportive enough to not shame me, like as if that was what I was contributing for the day. Mm -hmm. And they were just going to do everything they needed to to make sure that I felt loved and appreciated and encouraged if that was where I was coming from as a writer that day. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is definitely a room where you can sit and, 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 and have the emperor's new clothes on and everyone will still tell you that you look great. And that's an important place. I, I sent them the, immediately after I sent them the real pages and we had you know, a heartier dialogue. But the fact that that was a good test that day to see what that room was like, because there was no judgment, there was no ego, there was no unkindness in that room. Everyone was very genuine and invested in supporting me on a journey with a piece. I think that writers thrive on safe spaces like that because our work can be quite lonesome and nerve wracking. You are taking sinews of the metaphysical world and casting a spell through the vessel of your mind to make a version of them manifest in three dimensions for your world. That's what you're doing when you're writing. And that is a mighty task to do on your own. And you're not alone because there are others doing it with you. And the spirit is with you always. And those characters exist in the world too. So you're never alone, but you can be made to feel alone by the solitary artistic endeavor of writing it down. So it's important, essential really, to have a community to hold you accountable, to make you feel whole, and to let you know that you are not in a solitary silo doing this work. Mm -hmm. We thrive on community, you know. We actually, uh, we are in church. It is call and response. That's playwriting at, at its finest. It's call and response. So you were asking about Broadway. Broadway, <laughs> you go to Broadway to get a check, you know. It's a very transactional thing, but you also go to Broadway to be introduced to a new kind of audience. You know, it broadens the type of audience. It has this 
power just like film does to take work and introduce it to the masses. And sometimes along the way, compromises have to be made to the, to the script in order to make the work, what they say, digestible. Sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, the great uncompromising August Wilson, that's a perfect example of somebody who's, you know, stays resolute from one stage to the next. In fact, grows and uses each production to grow even more authentic until it gets to Broadway. You know, that's a beautiful example of somebody that doesn't stoop to conquer and doesn't compromise, you know, on the road to Broadway. And would that we could all be like that, and we should, and we will, and we and 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 I know some of the writers this season. I, I you know, one of them specifically is is a friend of mine, Antoinette Nwanda, who plays Passover, and I'm so so happy for her, and I know that she suffers no fools, and I'm really excited for audiences across the country to hear her unabashed and and vibrant voice on this stage. So I think I think they've got a pretty tough group of folks that are pretty resolute and unwavering so i'm not i'm not as worried for them i think that i think they're gonna bust the roof off these houses i think broadway will never be the same for from your and i i agree with you and i know several of the writers as well and yeah. i know several of the plays as well and i i they are resolute and they are they are uncompromising in their work what again, speaking from the eye, what I know about yeah. the Broadway is mm -hmm. it's about butts in the seats. Yep. And what I know about any straight play, period, <laughs> end of conference, that's not Wicked or Hamilton or mm -hmm. it's butts in the seats. It's mm -hmm. always down to butts in the seats and people, and, and we depend on, Broadway depends not on New Yorkers, Mm -hmm. It depends on the bridge and tunnel crowd and people mm -hmm. coming to New York to see a show. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, mm -hmm. I'm just going to break it down and say, if I'm spending $200 a ticket to come to bring my family to New York, am mm -hmm. I going to thoughts of a colored man? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or do we know that then, and, and knowing that or having that information, does the advertising agency and the people who are promoting that know that enough to say that we have to reach other markets? So because, and we cannot depend on that bridge and tunnel crowd. Mm -hmm. Like that's where my worry lies in how we're marketing these shows. Yeah. It's not about the quality of the shows and it's not about the artist's intention. It's about how do we make sure that the marketing teams do their job to get those houses filled so we can't they can't then say well see we gave y'all all these projections when nobody in the theater mm -hmm. well it's mm -hmm. about redefining the language around what you're selling and who you're selling it to and you know absolutely, absolutely. you know absolutely. and and who's and who's doing the selling absolutely you then know that's, yes that's the key i mean what I, a, a name is floating in this conversation that we haven't said yet and i'm going to go ahead and do it i'm going to open it up and say one thing that i think jeremy o'harris has been very successful at in terms of his various ventures in new york and in hollywood is using the arm of marketing to manage expectation and educate audiences on what they are receiving and galvanize them around an idea as expressed through art. Mm -hmm. That is something that I think he has been extraordinarily successful at doing. Now, I don't know how actively involved he is in the creation of those marketing campaigns. I know I will speak from the eye like you, Sharon, and say that whenever a show of mine goes up, I think very holistically about everything that's going on in that production, including and especially how we're interfacing with the butts that we want in the seats, because a show is not just what's on the page or what a director uh, interprets. A show, not the script, but a show starts from the minute that you start announcing to people that that event is occurring, who you say that to and how you interact with them, that the show begins then. And that's about developing an interest and managing expectations and growing an audience. Mm -hmm. So they have a task ahead of them for the bridge and tunnel folks and also the out of towners who are coming into town. How do you how do you get those people to understand this story is for you too? This is also our story. 
That's absolutely that's the, that's okay. The uh, so I so I have an important question here. We saw the film industry go through Oscars so white. Okay. And out of that, we got a moonlight. Okay. And they screwed that up even when they had the Academy <laughs> Awards. They they gave it to uh the uh the other movie uh that was white people doing jazz, whatever the name of that movie was. La La Land. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they, they <laughs> that they was got... a Freudian slip. That was yes. a Freudian slip. Yeah, well, whatever. It was it was uh it was pitiful. But how do you guys in the theater world not go through the same things that the film industry has gone through where it's like okay yeah black films are cool for a year or two and then go back to the old ways how do you get get past that and have some longevity with more black playwrights and i mean sharon i was blessed to see your show up in connecticut in new york okay but it's off broadway right it's always you know the kind of things that we really love are only off Broadway. How do we get Broadway to open their up their minds and their and their sensibilities out? Well, you know, I I think we uh, also have to we and I'll speak from the I we I us have to rethink what we if Broadway is the be all and the end. Yes, that's, hello. That's what come I'm on, Sharon. Here. Why do um, we need Sharon. to be on Broadway? Come on, yes, go with it. Because <laughs> I'm not really sure that's uh, that's it. I right. think we need to re-examine we all that time and energy and money that's taken to try to push our way on Broadway. Why don't we invest that into some black theaters and do some premieres and 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 highlight our stories in other places? Like I, I think that's the shift is that there's a bit more and I after this and we'll see what happens after this initial you know all these shows on broadway if that's like you know what let's just stop banging on this door got it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i i am the i am the um lead mentor and co-founder of the new visions fellowship uh with national queer theater and the dramatist guild and we mentor young transgender black playwrights and our interest is in actually decolonizing what success looks like and these playwrights that I'm mentoring are actually teaching me because they are not interested in being affirmed by the white theater establishment. They don't look at success and measure it by productions on Broadway. They look, they're very process oriented. And that's partially because they've been shut out of those channels of success measuring. So I look at them and I say, well, what does success look like to you? And they're like, success to me is bringing a community of, of my people together and having us be seen on stage and know that we're not alone. And we created a happening that people came to see. So it's a very community forward relationship to, um, to playmaking. I think, you know, you're asking how do we, how do we prevent the, the, the faux pas of racial recidivism, racist recidivism in the theater? Well, we have no control over that in some ways. We can't control the thoughts of our Connecticut train bound financiers. We don't know what they're actually going to think when they leave our show, grinning and smiling and shucking and jiving and telling us how great we are. And then they forget our names the next morning and confuse us with the next one who looks similar, but not really. You know we what? don't know. That. I endorse that because here in DC, we have a wealth of small theaters. Um, and I'm telling you, I'm an avid theater goer. And I will put down $40 to go see a play. And guess what? Two years later, it'll end up on Broadway. But I saw it when the actors involved were in an intimate space uh, communicating with us as the community that is there sharing with them. And then, you know, after the theater's over, they get with us in the lobby and we have a, you know, Q&A and a take. And what do you think about that? That's theater to me. And I love that. But mm -hmm. as always, we're way beyond our 30 minute mark because all of our guests are always so fascinating. But I want to uh, take a minute and let you guys close it out. 
and tell us um, what what's some of the stuff you're working on that you're looking forward to uh, actually being able to get in front of a live audience as we come out of this little horrible uh, period of existence we've been in. This is to both of you. Well, I'll start. I'm do I'm I'm um, I'm looking forward to going to my first uh, in person residency. Um, I was. Uh, working on a play uh, and I had was accepted to two residencies last year, but then COVID. So I'm looking forward to my first, I'm going out to New Harmony Project in Indiana and gonna work on a new piece out there for a week, which is lovely. You know, that's one of those things that as writers, we'd love to go and just for a week, not do anything, have somebody else feed us and talk about writing and take a walk. And, you know, just it's, it's a gift and a privilege. So I'm so looking forward to that. Um, and then honestly, the pandemic has sort of shifted what I'm doing. So I, I, I'm not going to be as an actor probably on stage anytime soon, just cause I just, I'm not quite feeling it yet. And I think they've got to get a handle on the, which is, it's, which is happening just, you know, yesterday, the other day, you know, vaccinating audience the steps are being taken so we can be safe in our mm -hmm. theater mm -hmm. world. Um, because film and television has a lot more money, they they kind of got it together a little earlier. So I've been doing a lot more film and television work and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'm looking forward to some more writing projects. So that's, um, so it's, I've taken, it's taken a bit of a shift uh, in a good way, in a good way, just expanding what, um, what I do as an artist. So I'm excited about it. I, um, well, by the time this airs, my show, The Duot, which is about a, a solo show about a, an FBI informant's spiritual reckoning in the Egyptian afterlife, will have closed. So that will have marked my regional theater debut at Center Theater Group. Oh, congratulations. That, thank you very much. That closes in the middle of August. And my film Taffeta will by that time have opened in um, in Bentonville, Arkansas, and also in Hollywood at Outfest. Those two I can announce. Um, there are some premieres in the Midwest in, in uh, a, a little city called Chicago that I don't know <laughs> if that, that I don't know if that will have happened. And then I've had some other international possibilities to come up. So Taffeta, my film uh, is out. And then I'm writing, I'm working on uh, a few pieces, including my treatment of um, Glass Menagerie from a Black and Filipino perspective mm -hmm. that I'm going to be uh, working on. It's called Waiting for a Wake. And that's being developed by Leviathan Lab uh, in New York. I have a show, a device show um, that I'm working on with Courage Theater. And, um, and then I have a few projects in the works with, um, page 73, including one that that uses uh, trap music to look at the demise of Storyville. So that's something that I'm working on as well. So I'm very happy and excited uh, to be to be making work at this time and and happy that we're in vogue and really looking forward to not having this generation's Langston Hughes write the article for the mm. next generation when the Negro was in vogue. Mm. I don't think, I. we need to do everything in our power to not have to write that article again. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys, really, you've been fantastic. We could go on for hours and maybe <laughs> after the season I was opens. Going, I was gonna try to convince <laughs> Michelle to do two episodes here, but uh, you know, it fell on deaf ears. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we want to respect time, <laughs> but um, we we would just love to definitely maybe think about having you back because mm -hmm. each of your uh, approaches to storytelling is really so fabulous. Um, Sharon, and I I watched you read a little part of that feeding the dragon, and I was like, oh my god, this is this is like a fairy tale that some little black child. Should can, can I just quickly interject? I mean, I, I saw her perform this twice, Michelle. Yeah. Both times I was bawling like a baby. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just telling you, you can't yeah. help but become emotional watching her play. 
Yeah, and Roger has such a great um, selection of stuff. I mean, you know, you, sometimes you, you think about the queer population and, you know, in our community, we often have issues with uh, homophobia and other uh, mm -hmm. kinds of homophobia, misogyny, or just all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. But in looking at some of uh, Roger's work, you just like, it's the story. It's about the story of the human being that is involved and it's so fascinating. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always going on about prisoners and I would just have loved to see the Kaya story uh, of the, 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 the narrative of the transgendered woman who was incarcerated. So, mm -hmm. you know, please make time for us to come back after your busy sure. works <laughs> so we can Absolutely. talk some more just about storytelling and the role of artists and playwrights and how uh, how you help structure society, right? Because it's just so fascinating. Um, and I think that deserves a show all, all its own. So, Absolutely. Thank you I'd so happy much. To come back. I would be more than happy to come back. Thank you both. We're going to hold you too. <laughs> so that will conclude our podcast on uh, Black Theater. And uh, we want to thank our special guests, actress and playwright Sharon Washington and Roger Mason, class of Princeton 2008, and also an accomplished playwright for both of their insightful commentary. Stay tuned for our next episode where we will feature two young Black entrepreneurs, one in fashion and one in finance, who will share their experiences developing their brands in their industries. If you enjoyed what you heard today, visit our website, NubianTigersPodcast.com. In addition to the podcast, we also post a resource page for each subject to provide additional information to our listeners. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Nubian Tigers, written as one word. We're also on YouTube on the Nubian Tigers podcast channel. Our podcast is hosted by Anchor FM, but if you have a favorite podcast app, we're probably on it. Just look for Nubian Tigers Talk. Looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you next time. Wake up, wake up, wake up.